It's always the fun part, waiting for people to gather, but thank you for your patience. Uh, again, welcome to today's webinar. We're happy to have you all here. We're gonna be discussing healthcare investing in 2021. Uh, quite an interesting year as it was for the last year as well. So we're excited to get to that discussion before we do a few housekeeping things to get through. Um, for those of you I have not yet had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Lena Dobrier. I'm the Director of Operations at Opus Connect. We are a professional organization catering to the lower middle and middle market uh, M&A space. So uh, our members primarily consist of private equity firms, investment bankers, lenders, independent sponsors. Uh, we have a ton going on at all times. If you know anything about us, you know that much. We are doing several different uh, event formats, member roundtables, fireside chats, deal connects, uh, where we're pairing up capital providers and investment bankers for one-on-one -on -one meetings. I'm sure many of you are participating in our healthcare-focused one directly to follow this webinar. Uh, but if you're interested in learning a bit more about who we are and how we can help, please reach out to my colleague, Swayze Yancey, whose contact information is below and who he will happily answer any questions you may have. Um, today's webinar, we will be taking Q&A. So the way that you'll be able to submit that is via the Q&A bubble below. You'll see it on the bottom of your screen. Please refrain from using the chat function. We will not be checking that, but submit your questions in the Q&A bubble and we will try to get to as many as possible. I want to uh, give our sponsors the opportunity to introduce themselves and say a few words. These events would not be possible without their support. So I'm going to start with David Kogan at Sapia Investigations. David, please introduce yourself and your firm. Good morning, Lena. Thanks for having us. This is David Kogan. I'm the managing director of Sapient Investigations. We're a corporate intelligence firm, and that basically means that we are we specialize in executive background checks, and we do a lot of work around deals, uh, private equity deals, but we also uh, work with large commercial lenders. We do joint venture partners, pretty much anyone in the in the deal ecosystem. Um, but we are again a broader firm, and we do a lot of stuff: business dispute work. Uh, benchmarking. So we really can get hard to get information um, basically for the corporate community. And if you if you should need us and need the services, please feel free to reach out to me. We've been with Opus for a long time and it's it's always great to be here. Thanks, Lena. Thank you, David. Good to have you here. Um, Fran, I see you in here. Please go ahead and introduce uh, Alliant and yourself, please. Good morning, my name is Fran Yurkovic. I'm with Alliance Insurance Services. We are one of the nation's leading and fastest growing distributors of diversified insurance products and services. We consider ourselves a specialty broker and I personally am involved with our M&A vertical. Um, we have a very active rep and warranty practice as well as diligence and brokering services available to all investors. Appreciate your time, thank you. Thank you, Fran. Um, I wanna give a quick shout out to Martis Capital. Uh, Vladimir is on today's panel and he's gonna introduce himself and his firm shortly. But I do wanna acknowledge him and thank him for his support for this event. And of course, Plant Moran, uh, Jerry Lubers of Plant Moran. He is actually today's moderator. And I think it is time for me to stop speaking and let him introduce himself and the panel. Well, Lena, thank you so much. We're excited to be uh, sponsoring today's uh, Deal Connect and uh, also excited to be part of this, uh, this panel. We've got an exciting uh, group of uh, individuals on the panel this morning and, and looking forward to hearing their thoughts on, on the kind of year we're having and, and what to, to look out for um, you know, around the corner. Um, just a quick introduction on Plant Moran. We're a national audit tax consulting and wealth management firm. We have a substantial private equity focused practice uh, serving uh, the entire PEG life cycle. Um, so from a due diligence perspective where I spend all of my time and, and most of it on healthcare transactions to 
pre and post integration uh, assistance, uh, post transaction audit and tax, uh, other consulting, and, and as well as uh, you know when it comes time to to consider an exit, you know assisting with sell side QOVs and, and other market dynamics uh, from that perspective. So excited to be uh, with you all this morning and uh, excited to, to be part of this uh, this panel as well. So uh, I'm gonna kick it over to, to Abid to introduce himself. Uh, Abid, go ahead. Great, thanks, Jerry. Uh, it's very nice to be here. Uh, uh, thanks to Jerry and Lena for moderating the session. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here, frankly, with some new friends in uh, Jonathan and Michael and some old friends in Vladimir. Uh, our firm invests in healthcare companies exclusively, uh, typically companies that are at the growth stage. Uh, I've historically spent my time in the healthcare technology and healthcare services verticals. Uh, and we would typically invest up to 50 million in any given opportunity. Um, looking forward to uh, getting to know everyone here and looking forward to the conversation. So thanks very much. Thanks, Avi. Jonathan? Well, thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Jonathan Bluth. I help lead the healthcare investment banking practice at Intrepid. Uh, we have about seven or eight folks that are dedicated to healthcare now. Uh, our practice continues to grow. Uh, as we've taken on many more mandates and covering the industry rather broadly. Over the last uh, 12 months or so, we've advised on the sale of a concierge medicine practice, Paragon, which we sold to Signature MD, a clinical trials and pathology business called Mosaic, which we sold to Cellcarta. Uh, most recently, we sold a, a really fascinating teledermatology business, Apostrophe, to hims and hers. Uh, we, we cover the industry much more broadly than that, just about every imaginable physician practice, specialty, uh, diagnostics, behavioral health, a lot of, a lot of time spent in revenue cycle. Uh, and while the vast majority of what we do would be sell-side M&A, either selling to private equity groups or strategics, we're also often working on buy-side transactions and other creative strategic alternatives. Uh, we're typically working on transactions that are in the range of 5 to 25 million of EBITDA. Uh, and there's a lot of activity in that space these days. So we'll be looking forward to talking with you about it during this call and in the one-on-one -on -one sessions afterwards. Great, thanks, Jonathan. Vladimir? Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, thanks, Jerry. And uh, <clears throat> thanks, Lena and the team for having me again on, a, on an event. I always enjoy these and hope to be back in person. <clears throat> I'm with Martis. Uh, used to be working alongside Ovid for many years and it's good to see see him here as well. Uh, we are a healthcare exclusive investment firm focused on the middle market. Uh, many areas of focus are healthcare services, healthcare IT and sort of consumer and products. Uh, very flexible on the structuring side and do both majority and minority deals and buy and build in. Typically from a size standpoint, um, companies uh, probably are greater than 5 million of EBITDA, but on the healthcare IT side, there's certainly more flexibility there. We look to deploy anywhere between 25 to 75 million per transaction. Uh, I'm based in San Francisco and the other half of the team is based in DC and I look forward to the conversation. Thanks Vladimir and last but not least, Michael, go ahead. Good morning, thanks again Opus and Jerry for, uh, for putting this together. Uh, my name is Michael Lamb, I run a investment and boutique, uh, an investment and merchant banking firm that specializes in tech-enabled outsourced business services. We have three primary coverage areas that we do most of our M&A valuation and consulting work in. Um, I lead our, a lot of our efforts in re healthcare revenue cycle management. We also do work in the call center and debt collection industries as well. Um, we've, uh, we have offices in Philadelphia and Washington, DC, and um, we've been very, very active uh, on the sell side part of our business uh, within the revenue cycle area. So everything from uh, companies that do uh, back-end collections, billing, coding, transcription, um, even uh, areas into insurance follow-up to denials management, uh, and then also into patient financing. So we spend a lot, a lot of time uh, in those areas and they've, uh, They've done fairly well uh, throughout COVID. Thanks again. Thanks, Michael. And, and um, 
you know, today is, as you can see here on the, on the screen, you know, we're going to be focused on uh, kind of understanding, uh, you know, from this group, kind of what we're seeing in the marketplace, but then also, uh, you know, what, what types of, uh, you know, uh, areas where we feel like there could be potential value or opportunities to build value uh, you know, as we look towards uh, the back half or the end of 2021. Um, Lena, maybe before we get started, uh, we could do a, a, uh, a poll question on uh, who we've got in the audience from a sure. perspective. Sure, let's, let's launch that first one. Please let us know who you are. We'll give it 30 seconds, maybe 20. Don't be shy. Uh, you should see a dialogue box pop up on your screen. We want to know if you're an independent sponsor, an investment banker, capital provider on the debt or equity side, service provider, or other. Are you gentlemen able to see this on your screen? Because it doesn't look like anyone is answering. Might well, have I could see it, but I could I couldn't press a button. I don't know if I was prevented because of the panelists. You're you're prevented. We we yeah. blocked you. No, the panelists are blocked. Um, let us know in the Q and A bubble if you guys can see this, and we want to know who you are. But we might have to move on, Jerry, because I'm not getting any love here. Okay. All right. Well, we'll get right into it and. Um, so yeah, it's it's been a crazy 2021. Not only from a, a you know living with the pandemic and, and the volatility around uh, case counts and variants and, and and the world we live in, but from an M and A perspective, it's been off the charts. And you know, why are we so busy, Jonathan? What are your what are your thoughts on what's creating this? Well, yeah, as you said, Jerry, we are coming out of uh, exiting one massive wave, entering what, what has been a pretty substantial surge again. Uh, we find that that whenever there seems to be a moment of peace, uh, when, when case counts seem to go down, we start to get a lot of calls. I think when folks have a chance to breathe and find a little bit of stability uh, during this, this crazy 18 month period, that, that we're getting a lot of calls with folks saying we just can't handle it anymore. We're keeping the company together, but we're exhausted. Is there another path? I think that combined with the, the likely probability of the tax code changes are causing a lot of people to reevaluate their priorities. Michael, any any additional thoughts there? Yeah, we're we're. Uh, I would echo what Jonathan's seeing as well. I mean, we're. The, the deal activity has been significant uh, this year, um, as well as obviously last year too, uh, but it's, uh, it's evolving. Um, we're seeing a lot more interest, at least in the revenue cycle areas, from, um, from more strategic as well as uh, larger private equity sponsors that are trying to develop platforms in these different areas, in the RCM area, specifically with technology as the core focus. Thanks, Michael. Vladimir? Yeah, uh, I think it's a good question to start the discussion. I mean, if we had this call any other year, I'd say healthcare is a growing sector, a lot of innovation. So you already see a good base level of deal flow. I think other areas that are driving transaction volumes these days are discussions around potential changes in the tax code, um, especially around capital tax gains. And then Michael and Jonathan would know this probably just as well, maybe better than Abed and myself, but uh, a lot of deals that probably were put on hold 12 months ago or 18 months ago as we entered COVID, they did come back late last year and into this year, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's still some sellers that are now saying, I'm, I'm ready now. I'm, I feel my business is again back to where it, where it should be and I get the, the right valuation. So that's another reason. And on the valuation point, again, we are seeing record valuations across the board. So if you're a seller, I mean, it's probably not no, no better time than now to explore some liquidity options or bringing on a partner. And, and last thing I was going to say is, I mean, we used to, we only spend time in private equity. And, but if you think about uh, public markets or uh, fixed income, I mean, private equity is, is really good. 
um, asset class. So a lot of LPs, institutional investors are plowing a lot of billions of capital into private equity. So there's just so much dry powder to be deployed that um, across the spectrum, built multi-billion dollar funds, funds of the size of Cuesta and Martis. And so people just, not the money is burning a hole in your pocket, but you got to put it to work at some point. And just all of that is coming together and creating a lot of just activity for, for buy sites and sell sites. If I could jump in and supplement what Vlad is saying, I think you're spot on. The, the level of sophistication and subspecialization of healthcare private equity investors has led to certain investors having spots. There are certain spaces that they know, they've recognized an opportunity, they've done their homework, and they want to go out and find that acquisition. Yeah. And so they are pushing certain sectors and themes. And I think you have that paired with several really exciting sectors. Uh, for example, areas around value-based care and population health management that are really seeming to come into maturity. Uh, the, 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 the changes in reimbursement during this period of COVID, especially enabling more telehealth services have allowed more population management capabilities. And there's more openness to some of these creative reimbursement models. That there, that's one example of one sector that's really coming into sort of a maturity stage at a time when there's also a lot of investors that have been doing their research and getting really smart in the sector. And we see that confluence in several other areas as well that seem to be just driving volume that sellers are, have better companies to sell, buyers have, have better theses, if you will, to, to justify their investment in those businesses. Great points, great points. Oh, thanks, Jerry. Uh, I, I think uh, Jonathan is absolutely right. And as a healthcare investor, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in everything that he has shared. And uh, we as a firm try to personify that. Uh, Vladimir hit a, a few great points with regards to the marketplace. And as I think about the market activity, one of the biggest reasons for the level of activity is the amount of cash in the marketplace. And so the question is, why is there so much cash in the marketplace? And, and really, there are probably three big reasons for that, right? Number one, uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy has caused this infusion of cash in the marketplace. Uh, number two, the lack of yield. Um, and that really has two impacts. Number one, as Vladimir pointed out, people are looking for returns elsewhere. Um, and two, there's cheap debt available. And so that automatically increases valuations. Um, and then lastly, and my third point really is, is two words, right? GameStop. Um, you know, Vladimir hit on the public markets, but as an owner of a business, if you're seeing that happen in the public markets, why wouldn't you want to monetize the asset that you spent years and years building? Um, and um, so combined with the availability of cash for all those reasons, with the maturity of the market that Jonathan outlined, uh, it's inevitable that you're going to see this level of market activity. Great points, Abi. Um, you know, we, we, we had another poll question, but maybe uh, since we're having some technology issues, uh, I'll just address it here to the panel uh, and we'll just go through it real quick. Uh, are you guys in, doing in-person management meetings or, or virtual or a mix of both? What, what does that look like right now? Jerry, I'll, Jerry, Michael, I'll chime, ahead, I'll ch yeah. Yeah, I'll chime in. We're, we're doing a mix right now, um, but uh, definitely seeing more of a push for in-person, but we're also trying to look at hybrid Zoom and in-person as a way to just get through, you know, figure out who's really interested in, in the transactions out of the gate, but definitely seeing more of a push for in-person over the past six months, um, a deal we just closed on out in Portland, Oregon with a sponsor. All of the meetings were done um, in person, which was, uh, it was great to see humans again. For sure, for sure. Uh, Jonathan? Yeah, I, I think a hybrid approach is, is the best way for, for a banker to advise a company today to, to look at the particular you know, personality and presentation skills of the management team to assess the, the complexity or differentiation of the company's business model. In some cases, uh, you, it is beneficial to have much more transparency and visibility pre-IOI. In some cases, you could run more of a standardized process. If it's an industry sector that's well-developed and understood, a management team that has a very clear and easily uh, understandable set of bio and a track record. But in some cases, Having those touch points are important. Uh, one of the things that we've 
started to do over the last 18 months, and we're continuing it even as people start to travel more and have more open meetings, is that we're in many cases offering these sort of one-to-many management presentations pre-IOI. Now, we don't do it for everyone. It depends upon the situation, but uh, we, we have offered to, to many of the folks who have received a book and starting to evaluate the company that we would make the, the management team available to present. Uh, therefore, the investors get to hear the company uh, from their own voice, not just the bankers, uh, but to hear the company describe the story, maybe address some of the initial questions that have come up in diligence. But it's also done in a controlled way that, that is protecting our client who may not yet be ready for the, 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 the broad discussion and one-on-one Q&A because we, we would just have it be a one-to-many session where they're just presenting to groups. We, we would receive questions and ask those questions to our client, but still able to control the, the discussion at that stage while giving access to investors to, to more direct interaction with the company. Thank you, yeah, that's great. I'll bet. Yeah, Jerry, from my perspective, it really comes down to um, the entrepreneurs and founders that we work with. Uh, we're happy to meet them in person if they'd like to meet in person, which I uh, prefer, uh, or if they'd like to do Zoom, that's fine too. Uh, you know, it, we do want to pay attention to health and safety. And what I always tell folks, I, I trained as a physician and I've uh, taken care of patients with uh, uh, conditions much more dire than COVID. And, and really it's about taking precautions, right? So if you're being smart about things, if you're just taking very simple, basic precautions, then it's okay to meet in person. Uh, and you know, as, as Michael said earlier on in the conversation, I, I, I do miss seeing people uh, and I've missed that for the last 16 months uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing more in person. Vladimir? I would just, yeah, I mean, I think it's well yeah. covered and I agree with yeah. everyone's points. Yeah. No, uh, we're we're uh, we're definitely seeing a mix. Uh, starting to see more of a trend to to in person, uh, but uh, I will say the the virtual environment from a Q of E perspective has made our work much more uh, efficient, if you will, uh, with you know less travel and 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 the uh, you know the the overnight the overnight stays. So I think from a Q of E service provider perspective, certainly. Um, has created a significant amount of efficiency, but uh, man, yeah, we do miss the uh, the face to face for sure. Um, moving moving on to our next kind of topic, and this is something that um, it's going to be interesting to watch over the next uh, three to six months. As as we all know that you know, there's questions around, you know, what are what you know, what taxes look like, and what does the new tax legislation, if it um, takes off and, and, and gets uh, gets through um, our uh, government bodies uh, later this year, or if it gets delayed to 2021, like is this the right time uh, to go to market? And I guess I want to start with our our private equity panelists first. Uh, Vladimir, what are your what are your thoughts here? Yeah, the there's, I guess, a question of a seller or a buyer, but uh, I think I'll take it from the standpoint of an entrepreneur deciding whether it's time to potentially explore liquidity or bring on a partner. I think the tax consideration is one aspect, um, but honestly, I think there's still uncertainty whether 1231 is the, the true deadline or it might become a 22 event. And I think there's other forces at play as well. So I was going to maybe address a couple of those. I think the economy is, for what we know right now, still in reasonably good shape. Uh, hopefully the Delta variants and others don't sort of uh, put, put a sort of pause on that. But if the economy is doing well, it probably means activity that we talked about, valuations are all trending in the right direction. So as a, as a business owner, it's probably a good time. The other consideration I was thinking through, um, if you are doing well, you're probably also um, facing some constraints on resources, human capital or, or purely financial capital. And so evaluating a transaction now might mean for you to bring on a partner that helps you go through those periods and you know, basically go after greater growth opportunities that you couldn't do on your own. Um, yeah, I mean, the other thing I was gonna, last thing I was gonna say is as a counterpoint and love to hear my panel, my fellow panelists thoughts is uh, we, we were looking at a situation where 
the business uh, approached us and we've had conversation with the business for a while, but they actually have done quite well during COVID to the extent that they actually uh, might hold off transacting because they're doing well and maybe in six months they can get even better valuation on, on greater sort of revenue or EBITDA. So that's the only point I think where you could say, okay, I'm doing well. I don't really need to take money now. Maybe in six to nine months, I'll be a bigger business and I could kind of revalue it then. But for all the other reasons, I feel it's probably a good, good time. It's Vladimir. I bet. Uh, thanks, Jerry. I, uh, this is an unprecedented seller's market. Uh, and so if you have a business uh, that you've grown and are looking uh, to monetize that, there, there is no better time in recent history than to do that right now. Um, obviously, there are things like tax considerations that are probably going to push you further in that direction. Uh, the one place in the markets where I have seen some softness is around SPACs, uh, which is old news to, to everyone now. But there are at least two cases where these companies um, had announced SPACs, were headed in that direction, but have decided not to go forward with that. And so in those two situations, I'm having conversations with them for potential investment. Uh, now, to Vladimir's point, if you have company specific reasons not to engage in a transaction, then that's something else. And that can actually break in, in both directions. Um, in the one hand, uh, if there has been softness uh, or if you think you need a little bit more of a runway uh, before you're ready to go to market, that's, we're certainly seeing that. Um, and in other cases, uh, folks have been, um, you know, incredibly fortunate in that the business has continued to grow. Um, however, I will say in those cases, and this actually has to do with our portfolio too, there are CEOs that I work with who are saying, hey, look, you know, I, I'm having trouble hiring. Um, I can't get enough software engineers. What do I do here? I need a head of this or a head of that. And what do I do here? Um, and, and also you have companies in our portfolio where we're looking at potential M&A events, again, because of the market activity. Uh, and in so those cases, uh, you know, everyone here on the panel would, could be a partner to help uh, uh, founders and management teams think through that. I'm, I'm certainly doing that with my current portfolio. Thank you, uh, Abed. Michael, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, we're seeing um, on the on the private equity side, one of the topics that's coming a lot, coming up a lot with our our clients on the sell side is not selling control, but just doing a minority stake with private equity. And that has been coming up more often in the past three months than I've ever seen it in my, in my 20 years doing this. I don't know if you guys are seeing the same thing, but there's been a lot of interest just to take some chips off the table, look at those options, bring in a new partner for all the reasons um, you've described, which is They've got a capital need, they've got labor uh, issues, they've got um, need for to make multiple acquisitions to grow, to help build the business. And so that's been a big topic, especially in, uh, in the revenue cycle area from, uh, from our side. Thank you, Michael. Jonathan? Well, one of the things that we're paying really close attention to, and it's affecting many of our clients uh, that are in market now, is the, is the way in which COVID works its way through a company's business model. And I, I think that in the first several months of COVID, we were all looking at an EBITDA number and trying to figure out, well, how do we pro forma adjust what EBITDA would have been if the company hadn't shut down or, or had minimal volume for a certain number of months. But there's actually the flip side of the equation because many companies really leaned into COVID, providing services around that, or their core services were bolstered by you know, some other shortage driven by COVID. And we're looking very carefully, and all of the investors in our clients' transactions are looking really carefully at bifurcating a company's growth from what is clearly COVID only versus what is not COVID at all, and then trying to make a judgment call about everything in between that may or may not have been artificially increased uh, or were there downstream effects related to COVID. And um, you know, we have certain clients that have shown that while they had a temporary bump related to COVID, that the core of their business continues to grow. And those are great stories. But it's particularly difficult when you ask that question, is now a good time to go to the market? 
it's a it's a very difficult question to ask when you look at someone's business, which appears to have been significantly supplemented by COVID related sales or services, and it's unclear how to design a, a proper run rate for the business. Um, you know, in, in some cases, we thought we had figured it out, and then there was another surge just over the last month or two. So we're spending a lot of time with companies that want to go to market now, that have not yet gone out to market, really carefully scrutinizing their business model to make sure that we can accurately predict the next six months. And that's a really hard thing to do anytime. It's even more challenging today. Yeah, no doubt. And, you know, as, as we are getting, you know, you know, over the last few years, the sell side quality of earnings um, analyses have become a bigger part of the, the, the sell side process. Um, and especially during COVID as, as we're trying to pro forma adjust, you know, uh, run rates to, to kind of uh, more normalize uh, earnings. You know, what we found is is that for those companies that could, you know, demonstrate that, you know, as you came out of some of those surges or waves that you were, um, you know, kind of regaining uh, the momentum again, you know, those were the companies that, um, you know, felt better about going to market because they could, they could show and demonstrate that they were coming back. You know, we, we, we have encountered situations where, you know, the businesses, uh, you know, for, for several reasons. Um, and in many cases, it's labor-driven and having access to the appropriate amount of, 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 of human capital uh, to kind of regain that momentum. So it, it's definitely been an interesting time. And, and, and yeah, there's so many things to consider as you, as you go to market and prepare to go to market and, and each, each case is different. So um, appreciate your thoughts there. Um, you know, one of the things that we've seen a significant amount of activity or areas we've seen a significant amount of activity in is um, kind of healthcare IT and, and, and not only on the IT side and innovation, but also uh, from a service perspective. And so you know, I want to touch on, we want to kind of touch on what types of innovative models we're coming across in the marketplace. I think there's a lot of excitement around innovation as there always is, but even in today's world, as, as we've shifted to a, a more virtual or uh, remote environment in many cases, you know, what types of uh, exciting things are, are you all seeing? And, and Michael, I'll, I'll start with you on, on this one. The, the, the patients or the, con, you know, the consumerism of healthcare has become a big topic um, in our world. And so as I think about where healthcare goes from the back end of all of the issues that exist with billing, um, price transparency is a big area of focus. And companies out there today are really trying to figure out how to solve for that. So people can understand when they go in for whatever procedure it is, what are they gonna owe at the end of it and how are they going to pay for it? And I think that that part of it is you're beginning to see that shift. And I think COVID has certainly helped move that along a little bit more in certain regions of our country. So I see that as a big area of focus going forward. Another big growth area is on the behavioral health side. And Jonathan, I'd be curious to hear your views on this too, is that we're, we're in the world we've been in, there's been a lot more mental health challenges and issues and that ties into telehealth, but also there's a whole segment of it around the back office side of cleaning up how to manage and how to interface with the insurance companies that are um, dealing with the patients around those um, uh, mental health bills and claims. And so there's a lot of opportunities there going forward as we continue to evolve with telehealth. And so I think that that's going to be another angle for private equity to be thinking about when they're looking to invest in certain areas of healthcare today. Yeah, I, I think that's a fascinating point. Uh, one of the areas that unfortunately has really been left behind in, in the automation and, and 
uh, revenue cycle improvements of the broader health industry has been behavioral health, where there's still a very high volume of paper-based claims. There's still an extremely high proportion of out-of-network or just non-covered services, services that just are cash pay. It just seems like it's sort of off on the side. Uh, and, and one of our clients actually has developed what appears to be a real game-changing uh, patient engagement, patient management, and, and broader revenue cycle platform for the broader behavioral health industry. And it's just really interesting to see that their conversations are, it's, it's not just trying to uh, convince a client to migrate from a, a legacy platform to theirs. It's trying to convince a prospective client to convert from paper to electronic. It's just amazing to see the, the volume of paper-based claim that still exists. And I think you're right. There's a pretty substantial amount of efficiencies that can be gained in behavioral health. I think we're on the verge of seeing a huge increase in volume of behavioral health care services. So creating those efficiencies from a systems and healthcare IT perspective is going to be a big area of focus in the years to come. Thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, Abed? Thanks, Jerry. Uh, uh, Michael and, and Jonathan have highlighted some of the themes that we're seeing in the marketplace too around um, uh, the patient experience or consumer engagement as well as behavioral health. Uh, earlier this year, uh, we made an investment in a company called Bicycle Health, uh, which is uh, in the behavioral health space uh, and they provide uh, treatment to uh, patients with substance use disorders. Uh, and uh, this was a space that I'd spent years looking at prior to making this investment. And so we're certainly seeing a ton of activity. Um, in terms of um, new models, I mean, or innovative models, we're certainly talking much more about value-based care. Uh, you had some uh, big names go public as well. Um, I, I think with, um, and value-based care has been around for, for a number of years now. Uh, and what I would say is, as a, as a provider organization, um, it, it's, it's obviously great to engage in value-based care to provide your patients uh, with a ton of value, but at the same time, from a financial perspective and the risk that you're taking on, it's, um, it's much tougher than it would be the case if you were in a fee-for-service model. Uh, and so you have to be um, an incredible provider who, who feels very comfortable with the fee-for-service model to be able to then migrate onto the value-based care model. Value-based care model isn't easier in any way or the, the thresholds aren't gonna uh, somehow create a better financial profile. Um, it's, a, it's a step above from where fee-for-service is today. Um, and when I'm talking to some of the healthcare provider businesses that we work with or some of the healthcare provider businesses that are making that transition, that's often a part of the conversation that we're having. Thanks, Abed. Uh, Vladimir? Yeah, I was just gonna build off Abed's point and some of the others that were raised, but on the value-based care side, uh, one area we'd like to more approaching is from the technology angle, uh, in part because the provider side is so hard, but uh, I still have to find the right solution. Um, there's a situation that might actually, I think one of the uh, attendees raised in the, in the, in the chat, uh, oh, sorry, in the Q&A, I noticed uh, technology for image processing. It, it made me think about a company we've been invested in for many years called Heartflow, which uh, is, has some elements of that. And I was gonna actually use the word AI as well. So it, it really, what it does is it measures the blood flow in your heart and all the arteries in your heart uh, non-invasively. So it takes a CT image of the, of the heart, which already exists, you go to the hospital to get that taken. And then it imposes on that it's technology it's software that basically models out how the blood flows so that's i think an exciting area it's obviously it's a it's a one such one area where it takes a lot of years to go through the clinical validity of of the technology the fda approvals the reimbursement so it's it's certainly in the heart flow case taken a while but the broader point was that AI and just technologies of that nature, I think are driving areas in, in, in healthcare that probably in the past, there was a lot more human in, um, input and uh, intervention. So there's increased efficiency because of AI. <clears throat> and two other areas I was gonna mention, Jerry, to your broader question about innovation is uh, with a lot of the COVID dynamic and, and, and a lot of needs for testing, what we've been seeing and paying attention to is um, opportunities to uh, assist uh, the lab market with um, efficiencies or even standing up operations. So we're 
in discussions and evaluating opportunities that help basically uh, lab companies uh, manage their processes more efficiently or frankly even uh, help hospitals outsource that function as well because it's been a bottleneck for them as well. And then another area, if you think about uh, on the on the earliest stage side, which again is below where um, earlier where Abbott and I spent time is really a lot of biotech has seen an incredible amount of funding in the last 12 months as well. And what comes as a result of that is um, a, a great R&D budgets allocated towards uh, clinical trials. And so big, big pharma companies in the context of the COVID vaccine is one example, but even just in the broader context of developing new sort of treatment modalities, uh, we are excited about identifying ways to make clinical trials more decentralized or virtual, as you might have heard that expression. And so you're starting to see more activity in that part of the market where I think historically private equity was probably more focused on CROs and pharma CDMOs, but maybe less so specifically about the clinical trials themselves, which is an interesting area. Thank you, Vladimir. And, and uh, you know, the, I think the, the comments and the thoughts around innovation uh, are, are all very helpful. And, and we all know that this is gonna be um, a significant driver in, in the healthcare landscape going forward as, as we continue to look for um, ways to improve and increase access and, and trans pricing transparency and, and reduce costs uh, because you know, healthcare continues to be a, a significant uh, uh, part of uh, our economic costs uh, in this country and, and globally. So. Um, yeah, I don't think the, the innovation isn't going to slow down and uh, it's an exciting time to, to, to be in this space. Um, we've got a, uh, a question from, from Jason Orr in the, in the audience that kind of dovetails into um, our, our, next, our next topic. And, and, and Vladimir, I was going to start, start with you here. Uh, you know, and we're thinking just kind of deals, you know, deal related, you know, some some uh, real life uh, examples maybe of, of, of deals or, or potential deals that blew up of, because of some change, whether it was uh, you know, a change in the market or change in the, in the business operation. Um, and, and, and the question from Jason is, uh, you know, related to, to adjusting financials, you know, challenges or difficulties and differing COVID related from non COVID related revenue and, and cost fluctuations that could could tie into something that 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 causes a a, a blip here in, a, in the process. Yeah, I wish we, we had a perfect visibility into how to tell these two apart. That's definitely a challenge. And um, I was going to give you a couple of examples here, Jerry. One is a situation and frankly, as time passes, the answer changes, right? Uh, because if something blows up right now, it's more likely that it's going to come back probably down the road when things settle down. So a year and a half ago in the early COVID days, uh, and Michael and Jonathan are probably seeing that with some of their clients, but things were put on hold, even if a deal might have been just launched because of the uncertainty we were all facing in March and April. And I think I would characterize it as something that was since sort of rectified. I think the deals came back later last year and into this year. So I think we actually were a beneficiary of one of those situations where uh, we were we met with a business a little less than two years ago, got to know them well. Um, it's sort of in the development and uh, contract manufacturing for uh, diagnostic testing, uh, a company we invested in called DCN where we met them in 2019, got pretty far along, and then just actually decided in April of 2020 to just put pa hit pause. They are focused on running the business. We are focused on the portfolio to have its point earlier. We got obviously have a lot of children, so to speak, that you need to manage in the portfolio. So 2020 was a big year for that. But then in Q3, Q4, we picked back up the conversation and uh, we were able to successfully close that transaction. On the flip side, maybe to, to uh, to Jason's specific question, a situation that we couldn't get comfortable with and ended up, we ended up not proceeding. I think it's still, again, uh, out of respect for the process, I think it's still ongoing. 
our challenges were just telling the inability to tell uh, what will be sustainable versus what was a one-time situation. And now that we're a year and a half into this, you would have thought some of these things would have worked themselves out. And I think on the physician practice side with maybe a, a business that has, that sees patients like an orthopedic surgery business or an ophthalmology business where patient volumes came back and you have a bit more of a normalized revenue levels these days. I think with this particular business, it was not really the case. They were selling into the lab market and the academic labs were, half of them were open, half of them are not yet open. Uh, the biotech lab market is for the most part open. And so it was, it was in short, just tough to understand what's the new normal. Maybe that's another way to address the question, but what is the new normal, right? Uh, and I think, unfortunately, the, the, the variants of COVID show us that we might live in a world that there'll be always some residual and Abit's probably the most qualified from all of us here on the call, but uh, with, with the medical training, but this might become a flu-like um, disease or virus that we just live with in some subdued sort of levels of um, severity, but, it, and then we just normalize for that and there's a new normal, but right now we just don't know, so. Thanks, Vladimir. Abed? Thanks, Jerry. Uh, and um, I, I think Vladimir's right in that this is probably something that is going to be endemic and that we have to just work with. Um, uh, but obviously, as vaccination levels uh, go up, that should help us deal with this on a more sustained basis. Uh, with regards to differentiating uh, COVID-related um, changes, uh, versus just regular changes in the business. I, that's that's a tough one. Um, I would say it varies quite a bit depending on the type of business. Obviously, the provider-based businesses have been more affected by it than a lot of other businesses. Um, and, and I don't think there's a great answer, but to the extent you can get as granular as possible with regards to where the revenues are coming from, how the costs are being allocated, I think that's probably the best way to, to figure that answer out. Um, you know, I would say we, we've been fortunate in that we haven't seen any um, uh, things go sideways too dramatically, but uh, I, I will say that there have been instances where uh, if our view on um, valuation has not coincided with the other party's uh, view on valuation, we've tried to stay disciplined um, and we owe that to our investors, to our LPs. Uh, you know, if we can't get comfortable with a number, we, we shouldn't uh, put something forward that we can't stand behind. And so that's that's been our philosophy. Thanks, Albert. Uh, Jonathan? Well, uh, there's there's yeah. two stories that come to mind when you ask, you know, have deals gone sideways or why? Uh, we, we had a client that manufactured uh, ventilation equipment, so respiratory equipment. Uh, and we were uh, midstream in our marketing process in like December 2019, January 2020, when all of a sudden they started to have huge demand uh, in from from some of their Asian markets. Um, this was the beginning of COVID, of course, and they had just explosive demand through Q1 and Q2 of 2020, ventilators being being acquired by hospitals across the country. They were, let's say, it was you know mid single digit million of EBITDA. This particular company. Uh, and so you can imagine what the multiple on that EBITDA might have been in a normal marketed process. Well, uh, because there was so much demand, the management team said, we have to put things on hold. We need all hands on deck for assembly just to get our product out the door to meet the demand. Understandable that we all wanted to wait. And uh, many of the acquirers were very interested in looking at this business uh, at that time. But when we touched base with the company just a few months later, when they were finally catching their breath, uh, it appeared that they were well on their way in that one year to exceeding the, the valuation that we would have expected in selling the business as a significant multiple that historically EBITDA in that one year's cash flow. There was so much profitability in the business that it, they were able to basically monetize the transaction without having to actually sell any equity. And they did not know how they were going to forecast the next two or three years. They didn't know if there would even be any demand. And so in that case, it made all the sense in the world for that company to put pencils down and just go back to running the business with no stress. And now they can even consider long-term strategies, maybe even giving the company to their employees because they've already taken all of that money out, if you will. That was a fascinating situation that I think was highly unique to what's going on in the world right now. But on the flip side, we're still operating in a highly regulated industry, regardless of what happens with COVID. 
And we're in many of our provider organizations, everyone is highly dependent upon what CMS chooses to do every year. And we're in the midst of a transaction process right now where CMS in its preliminary rule announced a more than 20% haircut to one of our clients' largest, highest volume CPT codes. It has nothing to do with COVID. The typical challenges that we all face within the healthcare industry. So in the midst of that transaction process, of course, it made, made sense for everyone to pause, reevaluate their priorities, uh, do more research on what they anticipate the final rule might look like come November and make a determination at that time whether it makes sense to proceed on the transaction. And that has nothing to do with COVID. Yeah, wow. Interesting stuff. Thank you, Jonathan. And, and Michael? Uh, yeah, I mean, one, one thing that we're seeing or we were dealing with then and still are at some level is we're doing a lot more work in from the hospital side of it, assessing if they're a client of the particular, if they're a vendor to the hospital, figuring out what's actually going on inside that hospital. Healthcare tends to be very regionalized. So if they were being affected negatively by COVID or whatever the issue was, trying to determine what was going to happen to our client before we were in diligence with the sponsor or strategic to know what the, what the risk factors were when somebody like you, Jerry, comes in and does the Q of E and starts really assessing the revenue. And so we were doing a lot more work trying to understand in gathering market intelligence, or is this particular hospital merging with this hospital, or is this physician group coming together with this one? Are they in a financially good position or not? And that was helping drive decision making on how and how we were going to market the company um, out to the street. Thank you, Michael. And and um, we we are coming up. Uh, I think we've got about five minutes left. And want to want to close with 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 some thoughts from from you all on 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 where you know where we should be looking um, or, or where you may be looking to to kind of find value or value creation and and uh, I bet I'm gonna uh, st start here with you just curious in closing here kind of thoughts around uh, value and value creation, if you will. Sure, Jerry, thank you. Uh, you know, from my perspective, from our firm's perspective, we really focus on uh, creating value for the companies that we work with. And uh, the question is, how do we do that? Well, it's, it's the same way uh, we've done it um, pre-COVID or during COVID and we'll continue to do it post-COVID. Uh, it probably comes down to uh, you know, three very basic things. Uh, number one, given the experience on the front lines of healthcare, being able to share that strategic perspective uh, with founders and management teams. Uh, two, just bringing resources to bear aside from capital, uh, whether that's on the clinical front, whether that's on the advisory front, um, or whether that's on the recruiting front. Um, and then three, just being a, a good trustworthy partner to our CEOs and our management teams uh, you know, they, they want someone that they can call and, and talk through real, real life issues with. Um, and that's what we're here to do. Um, and again, these are the same things that we were doing uh, prior to COVID as well. Thanks, Abed. Uh, Vladimir? Yeah, for sure. Uh, Jerry, happy to share some closing thoughts. Uh, one area that I'd add to what Abed shared was uh, just add on activity uh, from an MA perspective. Once you have a platform in place, uh, certain areas, given the fragmentation, really lend themselves to a, a creative m and uh, We've done it in the home health and hospice world. On the behavioral health side, we had an autism business that we explored some m and activity. And I think we'll be looking to do that with a, a new investment we're looking to close in the next month. So I'm really excited about that one on the behavioral health side. Uh, on the human capital side, just to maybe another spin on Abbott's point around building out the management team, which we obviously uh, always are part of, especially now that we have a lot of constraints on the provider side with uh, uh, therapists or home health nurses. We have a home health business that's living it uh, really daily now. So just trying to alleviate those pressures and really uh, share best practices across the portfolio can really help these companies that are really operating in their own world. But if you have the resources of a private equity partner, you could really multiply your knowledge base and resources. And then the last one, I'll just, uh, again, 
tie it a little bit to a point Ovid earlier covered around value-based care. I think generally, which we all hope with healthcare transitioning in that area gradually, uh, just assisting portfolio companies with that transition because uh, we see a lot of it across, again, situations. And I think when a portfolio company is dealing with that or is trying to broadly uh, move in that direction, I think having a partner alongside that can help uh, that can make a difference. Thanks, Vladimir. Uh, Michael's closing closing thoughts here on on value value creation. Yeah, I mean, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I think there are going to be some interesting game changers that start taking a, taking hold in healthcare uh, that are going to affect how that patient is interfacing with the hospital or physician group. That are going to be, I think, you know, over time going to be the way of the future in terms of how they're being dealt with, with everything on the back end of, uh, of the billing, the, the credit and collection cycle that exists. And I think a lot of that's going to be machine learning like, um, and I think it's going to take hold in healthcare in a pretty big way, because that's really what the younger generations, you know, the 25 to 35 year old population, that's what they want. They don't want to talk on the phone anymore. So they want to be able to deal in a portal automated kiosk fashion when it comes to healthcare, delivery of healthcare um, on the back end of it. So I see that being kind of the, the big movement down the line. Great, great points and observations, Michael. Jonathan, bring it, bring it home for us. We got a couple minutes left. Well, well guys, I, I think building off of what I've heard a lot of other folks talk about, I think one of the biggest areas of value will be if investors can find companies that have successfully navigated the movement into value-based care, either in the revenue cycle arena, think about legacy bills and collectors processing claims on the back end. Well, if you are a revenue cycle management company that has expertise in designing and adjudicating capitated claims, capitated plans, that's a huge differentiator, which is where the industry is going in. If you are a provider group, which understands how to, how to properly incentivize, guide your, your providers, how to engage with your patients around the appropriate use of care and preventative medicine, uh, an organization that has some sort of capitated or bundled payment where there's money to be spent on the social determinants of health, where you can really make an impact on driving down excess utilization or unnecessary care. Those are outstanding businesses where there's gonna be value. And frankly, we don't see a lot of companies across the country that have figured this out yet, right? And as we get into more and more areas in that question of where is the value, I think the value is in value-based care. Um, someone um, once told me that we're seeing that risk is getting a lot less risky these days. So it's the parties that either can take risk or know how to manage and manipulate the risk. It, it seems that those are the people that are figuring out how to make a lot of money in healthcare right now while still taking money out of the healthcare system in aggregate. So uh, I think that that's an area that all of us on the call are going to be looking at. And I think all of you uh, here listening in, it'll be an area that we'll all be spending a lot of time on in the future. Thank you. Thank, uh, well, this was a great discussion. And I want to thank all of our panelists, uh, Abed, Vladimir, Michael, and Jonathan. Great discussion. Thank you so much for, for, for making time in, in your day uh, to, to, to speak with us. Uh, this morning. Yes, gentlemen, thank, thank you, you so Jared. much. Absolutely. Thank you, thank for, you, Jared. Thank you. Thank you. for sharing your insights um, to our audience. Thank you all for joining and tuning in. We hope you found value in today's discussion. Um, to our sponsors, thank you for your support as always. If you are attending our Healthcare Focus Deal Connect, you're going to want to log out of this event, this link now and log into the separate link that was circulated to you yesterday. There's a lot going on at Opus Connect. We have a bunch of upcoming events. These are just a few, but you will hear from us. We'll keep you all updated. Uh, but again, thank you all for your time today and for tuning in. Um, we hope you all stay safe and hopefully we'll be seeing you in person sometime soon. Everyone take care. Hey, Lena. Thank you, Lena. Thanks, everyone. Take care.